If there's one thing everybody can agree on, it's that they love a good Disney villain song. For some reason, these songs always seem to have the best instrumentals, the best lyrics, and the most memorable visuals. My theory is that it's because villain songs fundamentally are all about personality. The best animated villains almost always have the strongest personalities of the cast. They're flamboyant, cunning, arrogant, dastardly, all those good adjectives, and that's going to translate into song. We really haven't had a true villain song since Mother Knows Best in Tangled. Frozen didn't have one unless you're weird and want to count Let It Go, and Encanto's villain was generational trauma. You can make an argument about Shiny and Moana, but I don't really count it since Moana didn't have a major villain, just an obstacle that had a song attached to it. Mother Knows Best is the most recent Disney song where the main villain sings about their particular strain of villainy. In Mother Gothel's case, it's about being a manipulative and emotionally abusive mother who wants to keep Rapunzel where she is. It lays out not just who Mother Gothel is as a person, but also her motivations and goals. That's what makes a great villain song. You can see the same thing in earlier songs like Be Prepared and Poor Unfortunate Souls. Many people consider the best Disney song of all time to be Hellfire from Hunchback of Notre Dame. While I personally can't choose a favorite myself, I could definitely see why someone would choose Hellfire. It's an excellent example of musical storytelling. You can tell that every aspect was deeply thought out. The religious imagery blankets the entire song, emphasized by the famous visual of Frollo running through the hooded, chanting figures. That's the power of a villain song. It encapsulates what the character is all about. And since the antagonist is often the main force of the story's progress, it can also change the story and its themes as a whole. A good villain song also progresses the story forward, as any good musical number does. Friends on the Other Side is where Facilier lays down his curse. Poor Unfortunate Souls is where Ariel gets turned into a human. Be Prepared is where Scar asks the hyenas for help in his plan. Exceptions would be Mother Knows Best and Gaston, which simply establish character, but in the case of the latter, Mob Song provides another sequence for the villain to actively push the story forward. Mother Knows Best gets a reprise down the line later as well. You could say This Is The Thanks I Get From Wish fits these qualifications. It establishes Magnifico's personality and motivation, which are going to play into the story. So why has the reception been so poor? Let's break down the song. I know it's only been three seconds, but I already have an issue, and that issue is going to extend through the entire song. This is a pop song. It's structured like a pop song. It's written by a pop song writer. It's produced by a pop song producer. So naturally, the instrumentals sound like a pop song. And not a good one either. The biggest problem of this song, though, is the lyrics. We can see issues starting from the second couplet of the song. It's genetics. Yeah, I got these genes from outer space. This is a redundancy, which is my pet peeve in songwriting. Once you say it's genetics, you don't also need to praise your genetics for a second time. Redundancy bothers me so much because most songs are so short, only a couple hundred words, so each line needs to count. Outer space is also just kind of awkward sounding in the rhyme scheme because the first syllable of outer is strong enough to feel like it also warrants a rhyme of its own. But the previous line doesn't rhyme with the full phrase outer space. That's minor though, so let's move on. I'm passionate, I'm not petulant. Someone praise me for my benevolence. The way that he puts emphasis on I'm passionate, I'm not petulant implies that these two adjectives are opposites, which they aren't. Petulant means irritable and rude, and a person can easily be both passionate and rude. If he said I'm passionate but not petulant, the line would make more sense. Little things can make a difference. Another thing that makes the stanza sound awkward is that the ear expects a rhyme with omnipotent, but gets petulant, which is a minor slant rhyme at best. I put the eye in omnipotent, I'm passionate, I'm not petulant. It's because of how the words break down. The emphases are omnipotent and petulant. Since the emphases don't rhyme, the words don't rhyme, even if their last syllables technically do. The next line ends with benevolence, which does rhyme better with petulant. This just wasn't the place for an AABB rhyme scheme. A straight AAAA where every line rhymes would have been better. The next stanza is better, I'll give it that. It's a cute characterization. But then we get the most infamous line of the song. I'll let you live it for free and I don't even charge you rent. It's redundancy at its worst. I saw plenty of people online clowning on this because it literally just states the same thing twice. Like, yeah, if they're living here for free, then they don't have to pay rent by default. You don't need to say it. If you'd think they'd all be content, all I really want is just a little respect. The next part has a similar problem to the AABB part. After three ent rhymes, your ear expects a fourth, but instead you get the word respect. This is another slant rhyme. Slant rhymes are okay sometimes, but musical numbers tend to use full rhymes more often than pop music, which you know, pop songwriter, etc. Respect here is meant to rhyme with the choruses, this is the thanks I get. If that's the angle they wanted, they should have used rhymes for get leading up to the chorus. There's like a lot of those. The chorus just repeats, this is the thanks I get, so it's not like you're going to overload the get rhymes by using them before the chorus. And let's talk about this chorus. This is the thanks I get. 
The little doot doot doos in the background completely take away any intimidation factor. It sounds like a glee cover, derogatory. If this is Magnifico showing his true colors, the instrumentation should reflect that. It shouldn't sound like a happy pop song, it should sound intimidating and vindictive, which is how the writers clearly want Magnifico to come off, especially at this point in the story. This instrumentation could go under almost anything but a villain song. You could sing a sappy love song over it without changing anything, and it would work. People have been saying Wish feels AI generated, and I can absolutely see that in this chorus. The second verse also struggles. Magnifico continues to hype himself up, but the joke is tired by this point. We get that Magnifico is arrogant. Repeating it without any flavor isn't going to enhance the song. Compare this to Gaston, which utilizes comedy more effectively by actually being clever. Gaston also establishes how the village views the titular character, which is important to the plot, so the more the merrier. There's also this line. And you still complain ungrateful much. Julia Michaels is only 30, but this line in particular feels like it was written by a man 15 years older. Such a forced rhyme, too. It reminds me of how Maui rhymed below with yo, except without any of the charm. The next line rhymes prob with job, and there's another really awkward line with the disrespect I just underwent. I just underwent. Professional songwriter. Anyway, the second time around, there's actually get rhymes leading up to the chorus, and you'll notice this sounds a lot cleaner than the first verse. Sweat since the day you were born and the day that we met. And this is the thanks I get. Of course, I still have a lot of issues with that chorus. The second chorus sounds identical to the first. This is the thanks I get. And this is the thanks I get. There hasn't been any buildup or sense of scale yet, which so many previous villain songs have. The bridge is where the buildup is, but it's just so out of nowhere that it sounds like a completely different song. I didn't want to do this. I swore I'd never do this, but I- I understand what they were going for here. Magnifico's facade is falling, he's breaking down, and he's being obviously evil now, resorting to magic he previously didn't want to use. If they wanted to do that, they should have hinted at it earlier in the song, especially in the second verse and chorus. Use some instrumentation from that bridge in that verse to represent how the facade is cracking, with the bridge being where it completely falls away. That would have been a much more natural way to tell the story as opposed to jarringly switching instrumentation. It feels like they put in that bridge because they knew that they needed the buildup like other villain songs, without understanding why those buildups exist. They exist to make those songs feel huge and important, as well as progressing the song instrumentally instead of just having a flat song like This Is The Thanks I Get. This also isn't even at the end of the song. There's another verse and chorus after this, which completely deflates the buildup of the bridge. Compare this to say, Be Prepared. Though the song starts relatively subdued, by the end it feels absolutely massive. The way Scar basically roars his final lines to drive home how important the scene is and how motivated Scar is. It was so intense that Jeremy Irons famously blew out his voice for it. Be Prepared isn't a long song either. It's only about two and a half minutes when you count the parts with singing. Hellfire is also about that long. This is the thanks I get would be about two and a half minutes if it ended after the bridge. I wonder if they added the last verse and chorus because they wanted it to be the length of a typical pop song. A musical songwriter might add dialogue or an instrumental break to lengthen the song and add more dimension, but a pop songwriter wouldn't think of this. They go the route they're more familiar with. So instead of ending the song on a high note, it ends on a chorus, which sounds, again, the same as the first two with the exception of a yell at the end. This is the thanks I get! This is the thanks I get! As a piece of storytelling, this sequence also fails at being especially villainous. Up until this point in the story, Magnifico has been pretty much reasonable. He won't grant wishes he considers too vague or dangerous, and he only gets this upset because he feels like there's a threat against his kingdom and his subjects only care about themselves and their wishes. His anger is, for the most part, justified. He's not being evil, he's being human. At least he was until he opens that book and a few minutes later suddenly decides he wants nothing more than power. There's no slow descent into madness or a fatal flaw or anything, just a sudden turn because the plot demanded that Asha be right. This happens an hour into a 90 minute movie, by the way. A good word for this song would be safe. I can really see the AI-generated arguments. It checks off the boxes for a Disney villain song, but does it without any passion or risks. Just look at the visuals. Where are the intense colors or imagery? Even Mother Knows Best played around a lot with lighting. Just compare Thanks to something like Friends on the Other Side and it's like night and day. Friends utilizes its color palette expertly and the visuals are filled with little details, like how the pattern on the walls turns into skulls when Facilier's shadow goes over it. Thanks doesn't have any of that. The visuals are plain. It's, it's mostly just Magnifico walking around with a little bit of extra lighting later in the song. Artistry comes from risk. Hellfire will always be remembered for his greatness because it took a massive risk by throwing concepts like religious guilt and vengeance into a kid's movie, and it didn't hold back at all. Challenging your audience, even making them uncomfortable, is key to driving home important themes. 
Disney shouldn't be concerned with potentially scaring two-year-olds in its villain sequence, but in This is the Thanks I Get, it felt like they were. Villains should be frightening. It's what makes them memorable. They're villains. They're evil. I'm not saying Jigsaw should be the next Disney antagonist, but we need someone with an edge to them. Unless you're doing some thought exercise on morality or making a gritty action movie, villains should be as villainous as their heroes are heroic. It's what makes them so fun to take down in the end. I saw a lot of people complaining that Magnifico simply isn't evil enough. He's arrogant, yes, but refusing to grant everybody's wishes isn't exactly the same as trapping souls or burning down Paris. I mean, obviously not everybody's deepest wish should be granted. There are some horrible people out there. Not to mention that he provides his people with free living and protection, even if he is keeping them complacent. The movie is so gutless that it can't even make its villain evil, until the plot absolutely demands it. Even AI wouldn't do that. This is the result of people in a boardroom trying to impress as many other people as possible. And it didn't work. Through its first month, Wish made well under a third of the domestic box office that Frozen did, and they released during the exact same time of year. Since Wish's box office failure, Bob Iger has come out and said that Disney movies should focus more on entertainment and less on messages. While you can argue that, I don't even know what the message of Wish is. Every wish should come true. Teenagers are always right. A lot of people complain about Disney going woke, but I argue that they were way too safe in the case of Wish. AI generated or not, something needs to give and something needs to change. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you had a good holiday season. Check out my other videos for more analysis on Disney songs. Have a great day.